Picture yourself in sunny Spain. The castanets, the colors, incredible heat, and the smell of orange blossoms. They all combine to create this exotic atmosphere, and the music is immediately recognizable. So let's go off to Spain today on a note to you. I'm Virginia Eskin. I think that Spanish music evokes Spain more than any other country's music evokes their country. You know, when you think of Russians and Russian music, it's always in a minor key and sad. You think of French music, it's sort of skittery and elegant. Italian music is usually very voluptuous and romantic. And Spanish music seems to have the weight of that dark country all woven into it. And the music is very beautiful, and today's program is going to explain how it got that way. But first we want to just compare what you hear when you think of 17th century English music, and that would be from the court. It's very formal, and it's very English. Listen to this little bit from Purcell. See what I mean? It's very, very sort of rigid. Actually, that was Andres Segovia playing a little movement from a suite by Purcell. And even though he's a Spaniard, he's playing that very correct sound. And now we want to make an immediate contrast with the same period of music, 17th century, but this is by a Spaniard, Jose de Vaquedamo. And listen to the sort of jerky rhythms and how vital it sounds. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Did you hear all those wonderful sort of cross rhythms? That was called Diga la Admiración, which means See the Wonder, and it was sung by the Compostelana singers. And it certainly has a Spanish quality if you listen to that. Because the English would have done it just the opposite. With a downbeat, would have been... would have been sort of patient. But... What we're trying to point out is that the Spanish are always sort of turning things upside down, and rhythm has to be a huge part of that. And then the next thing that comes along when you break down what makes Spanish music Spanish is the melodic scale, and they get that idea from the Arab influence. And it sounds... It immediately creates a very exotic quality instead of just a melodic scale by making it flat. And that's very Middle Eastern sounding. And of course, we know that all the great, incredible um, geometry and all the creation of the great Alhambra Palace, that was all due to the Moorish and Arab influences. And that was put in motion very early on. Then you also add sort of the folkloric quality, and that comes from the dancing and the singing. And we want to flavor this now with, um, this is a fandango, and I insisted on including this because I love the way the rhythms, even though it's for flamenco dancing, they are definitely getting the idea from the court, the accent being on the end of the phrase. Listen to this Pepe Valencia and Luis Maravilla playing the guitar, and you'll hear what I mean. The rhythm just doesn't stay constant. It's nothing you can rely on. Estoy loco, ya estoy cuero. 
Well, you sure get the picture there. That man is very unhappy. I'm thinking of a machismo Spaniard who's been uh, locked out of his beautiful grillwork home. It was sung by Pepe Valencia and accompanied by Luis Maravilla. And my point is that if you could hear the scale that I mentioned before, he was using it over and over. That's what gives Spanish music this incredible flavor, that very sad scale. And then on top of that, you think of the guitar, it's always been a political symbol for Spaniards. And I was trying to think of why that is. I think it's because you can take a guitar anywhere. And the cliche of a Spaniard sort of um, propped up in a doorway, that's not for nothing because the guitar is something that you can afford. It's an accessible item. It's not like a piano. There are very few pianos, in fact, in Spain. They don't even have a piano manufacturer. And the guitar was always available. So the farmer, the um, sheep herder, all these people could have a guitar. And the guitar is always good company also. And then when you see in the political big paintings done by Goya, there inevitably is a guitarist over in the corner. And that's another flavor that comes constantly through Spanish music. And even though some of the music that we'll hear in in a little bit is written by the masters of the keyboard, they are going to imitate really what guitarists naturally do. Here's a beautiful piece by the first master, Isaac Albeñez. And he was born around 1860 and died in 1909. And so that's a very short life. He was only 49 years old. And listen to this beautiful guitar transcription. It's called Torre Bermeja. And that apparently means rouge-colored or red-colored land. And that's also another aspect of Spanish pieces. More than French or Russian or English, they tend to name their pieces after sites. Mallorca or Andalusia or Barcelona, the... Wherever the area is, that's the name of the piece. Here's a beautiful guitar piece by Albeñez.
Sweet Little Piece by Isaac Albeñez, and it was called Torre Bermeja, which means red-colored land, and it was played by Ernesto Bitetti. Could you hear how the melody was on the top? And there were all these little sort of rolling chords underneath it. Well, that lies very well on the guitar because the melody is plucked by one finger and then you have the other fingers put into use for that sort of arpeggio. And Albanias apparently had a sort of a rough beginning when he was about nine years old. They entered him in the conservatory in Madrid and he ran away. He didn't really take to the discipline. And then three years later, he stowed away on a ship when he was 12, bound for South America. And for five years, he led a sort of a nomadic existence. He wasn't seeing much of a piano. But then when he returned to Spain in 1877, he was sent up to Brussels. And that led also over to the continent. And he eventually studied with Liszt. And that would explain why he's such a master composer for piano. So even though Albanius doesn't have a long life, in about 1906, three years before he dies... He decided to really tackle what would become his masterpiece, and that's called Iberia, and it's named after the peninsula, a very hot area of Spain. The Spanish pianist Alicia de la Rocha made her career on this suite, and there are two books of pieces. It's very large. You rarely will play the whole thing at a concert. You would play selections from it. And I want you to hear this one. It's called Triana. It's from book two of... Albania's a suite from Iberia, and it's played by De La Rocha, who's really the master. And listen to the way she spins out the lovely melody, and then you'll hear all the strumming. His music is complicated because it's written with three staves. But let's listen to it, and then we'll talk about it after that.
Ole! That was Isaac Albanius's Triana from Book Two of Iberia, beautifully played by Alicia de la Rocha, and she really owns that music. We're taking a good look today on a note to you at what makes Spanish music Spanish. Could you hear how beautifully she threaded the melody when, and the, all those big, long... There are three things going on at once. You've got the assault of the big chord, and then the melody, and then he throws in just a little sort of a wiggle-squiggle of a chord, because on the guitar you can reach over and do that. Not so easy to do on the piano because you only have two hands and they're usually spread out over the keyboard. But that's the pianist problem. We're going to hear another little piece by Albania. This, this is named for a site, as I said before. Spaniards love to pay homage to parts of Spain. There certainly is a famous part called Mallorca. We all know about it because that's where George Sand dragged poor ailing Chopin down there, hoping she could cure him and put him in a hot sun. And apparently it turned into a rainy, rainy period. But when you listen to this piece, you'll think really of sun-drenched Spain. And it's a nice version of it. It's a transcription for viola. And you can really hear the melodic quality that Albanius is able to spin. Here it is, Mallorca.
That was Mallorca by Albanias, and it was a transcription for viola and piano, and it was played by Ellen Rose and Catherine Collier. We're looking at Spain, and I hope you're enjoying it. As I was listening to that piece, I sort of imagined gobbling some paella and then sort of flush it down with vino tinto. I remember when I went to Spain, I loved the idea that wine was called tinted or white, vino tinto or vino blanco. I hope you're enjoying our visit to Spain on A Note to You. I'm Virginia Eskin. If you'd like to write us, we'll write you back. The address is A Note to You, care of WGBH Radio, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email address is a note to you at wgbh.org. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. One of the most interesting aspects of Spanish music, I think, is that it has so many different dance forms. More than other countries, they seem to really celebrate dancing and dances, dances to do yourself, dances to look at, dances to listen to. There are all these wonderful names, the habanera, rueda, the segadilla, tonadilla, and of course, zarzuelas, which are not only dance sort of spectacles. A zarzuela is a kind of a little comedy of operas and dancing and Poetry, it's a combination of things that the Spanish dreamed up. Here's a little selection from a folkloric piece, and it's a dance, and you can hear the the dancer's hooves on the floor. I just want to always return to sort of the folk element that runs throughout Spanish music. Even though we're concentrating on the elegant piano music, that's where these composers got really all their ideas was from the folk music. Here's La Cana played by Roman El Granino.
Well, that was certainly folkloric playing, and it reminded me of the wonderful wrought iron that you see when you go to Spain, all that sort of uh, configuration. can't just stick to a D minor scale. Well, we're going to now move to the music of Manuel de Falla, because if Albeñas is the first serious piano composer from Spain, de Falla follows in his footsteps, and he has a much longer life. He's born in 1876 and lives till 1946. So that's a nice big chunk. And even though he happened to live through the horrible Spanish Civil War and his good friend Lorca, was murdered, and that had a devastating effect on de Falla. He still also went to Paris and studied and with uh, the masters up at the conservatoire, and then he returned to Spain and dedicated himself to writing music that was a picture of the Spanish life. And he was a kind of a perfectionist type. When you read about him and you look at the pictures of him, he's very drawn-looking, very narrow face. He's not fleshy like the other Spaniards. And apparently he had to have his clothes pressed, and he was, he sounds like he would have been a very difficult man to be around. And he used Grieg, of all things, as a role model for taking folk sort of elements and putting them into his music, because of course that's what Grieg had done with Norwegian music. And de Faya is most famous for all the pieces he wrote about the dance. And the one we're going to hear now is called Dance of Horror, and I think the horror part is the fact that it's so hard to play. And it's played by a Spanish pianist, Carlos Rodriguez. And listen to how it works itself up into a major swivet. I think the horror part, as I said before, is making the re notes repeat on the piano. On the guitar, it's not a hard matter because you just go to the neighboring string and you can go back and forth because the left hand puts down, say, two A's and then the two fingers can go back and forth. But on the piano, you only have one A and you have two fingers and they have to sort of do a major dance. And that's an aspect of Spanish piano music, which has put a lot of people off, I think, from learning it. And the pianist Arthur Rubinstein was very instrumental in performing the um, fire dance of Manuel de Fire. He used that as a common encore. And I think he even knew de Fire, 
who after the Spanish War was incredibly disappointed in Spain and actually went to live in Argentina. And he died there, but his body was returned back to Cadiz for burial. And so in the end, he returned to his beloved country. And he branched out and composed some operas and a famous ballet called The Three-Cornered Hat, he was a little more evolved, and of course he lived longer than Albania's, so he was able to do that. His masterpiece is considered The Knights in the Garden of Spain, and we've chosen a selection from that. It's called The Distant Dance, or Dance from a Distance, and it's the middle movement.
That was just a selection, the middle movement from The Knights in the Garden of Spain, played by Angela Cheng and the Calgary Philharmonic. It's a Canadian orchestra conducted by Hans Graf. And we're looking at the music of Spain today on a note to you. I had mentioned before the political implications of the guitar, and I ran across this Lorca poem, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it speaks to exactly this point. It says, The weeping of the guitar begins. The goblets of dawn are smashed. The weeping of the guitar begins. Useless to silence it. Impossible to silence it. And it sounds like Lorca is using the guitar as a metaphor for the hideous political situation because all the artists were very, very upset with Franco. I mean, we know that Casals was so upset that he left, and so did Defaya. I want to play a piece for you now that's a favorite of mine, and we're going to finish out the program with the last Spaniard. His name is Joaquin Turina. He had a relatively long life, and an interesting one, because he spanned music sort of of the 20th century, and you'll hear how Spanish Albania's music sounded, and then Defaya is sort of pushing the envelope. It's beginning to sound a little bit like Hollywood to my ears. And then Torina, in the beginning, he sort of harkens back to his Spanish roots, and this little piano piece I'm going to play has a very Spanish quality, and then we'll hear a piece that he's sort of flirting, actually, with modern music. This is called Sacromonte, Sacred Mountain. I like all those modal things. And he's flirting with major and minor. In Spanish music, it doesn't just sort of stay in any one slot. They put uh, F and F sharp together. That adds a sort of a tinge of melancholy. So Torina is very much a Spaniard, but he, like the other Spaniards, they go up to Paris to study. I don't know why they didn't stay in Madrid, because there was a conservatory there and a fine music culture, but they apparently all feel they have to go north. And in 1907, there's a little story. Defaya was in the audience when uh, Torina had played, and afterwards he took him to a cafe, and he advised him that he should cast off his conservative quality and return to the Spanish folk idiom for inspiration. And this next piece that you're going to listen to has a foot in both camps. It's perhaps Torina's most complicated piece. It's called Symphonic Rhapsody. And to my ears, it has a Spanish flavor, not as graphic as the ones we've been listening to. You can hear the Spanish sort of tinge in there, but it's definitely getting European in sound, maybe even uh, like a soundtrack for a movie. Listen to it, Symphonic Rhapsody.
That was just a portion from the Symphonic Rhapsody by Joaquin Turina, played by Angela Cheng with the Calgary Philharmonic. It did sound a little bit, didn't it, like the Spanish boy gets the Spanish girl, something a little uh, Hollywoody about the sound. And we've had a sort of an interesting time looking at Spanish music. I think it's interesting. It vacillates between civilized and savage. And the rhythm and the Arabic influences and the almighty guitar, they are always predominant in Spanish music. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you feel the urge to write, here's our address one more time. A note to you, care of WGBH Radio, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email address is a note to you at wgbh.org. Our engineer has been Ray Fallon. Our producer is Alan McClellan. And I'm Virginia Eskin. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. It's produced by Northeastern University in cooperation with WGBH Radio, Boston. <laughs>